Saturday morning, we call it plus sports special on the program. And of course, we talk about sports extensively, different sports. But this morning, I start with um, something that comes away home. During the week on one of our news packages, you saw the sports news. There was a point where I asked the vice president of Nigeria Football Federation, his name is Sheyakiumi. I said, how are the Super Eagles going to go to Benin Republic, Porto Novo precisely? I said, by air, by car, or by sea. And the man replied to me and he said, jokingly, he said, by air, you wish. Honestly, my name is Wally Scott, you guys know that. I will not take anything and lying down. I will stand up and take it. And I took that, it made it sound like a joke. I took it very personally. Our eagles stood lowly to be taken by air to the Republic for the vice president of our darling NFF to tell me, you wish. He was wishing I wished that our eagles be taken by air. I saw that, honestly, very insulting, Victor. Welcome, Victor. Geoffrey on the show, sports analyst. Thank you for joining us on the show. Um, to he was a joke to him. I didn't, well, find it, I didn't find it funny. I know you didn't find it funny, but the reality of the matter is that that actually happened. To, my, to be honest with you, when I saw that, I mean, there are clips on social media, and I saw that the national, senior national team of, uh, of, the Niger, of Nigeria were going through uh, to play a football match, an official CAF and FIFA sanctioned qualifier you know, match, highest level of professionalism you expect. I was a, a bit surprised because I was like, really, they're going to go through ferry to Port Novo, that is just, I mean, this is the national team, three times African champion. We've gone to the World Cup so many times. Like, these are top level professionals who have played, who play in Champions League football, who play in the best football leagues in Europe. And they were all going across via, you know, the ferry. Now, is that an explanation? Obviously, unfortunately, in Nigeria, you don't really get that kind of level of transparency. So we don't even know what their reason was for that actually being the case. Whatever excuses they may come up with, I think it's just beneath the national team to go to. Uh, Benin Republic, even if they are neighbors via the ferry. Like, let's, let's have some respect for these guys who have come. And don't forget, we are in the post-COVID era. Some of them are taking massive risk to even come to play for the national true team. There certain players that didn't even come through. Romero was one of them, just to mention a few, that were not even allowed to come to, you know, to play for the national That's team. That's the NFF president, Amadou Penic, on the boat so, too. Exactly. Yeah, on the boat too. <laughs> and Gennot Raw, the coach. It, to be honest, it feels like a bunch of uh, friends going for a party. Yeah, a picnic. Yeah, at, at, at I was telling beach. someone a few minutes ago, <laughs> the, the friend of mine works at the BBC, yeah. and um, his name is Peter. Mm. And we're talking, and I said, listen, Let's forget about all these Grammy Award winners and all that in the past few weeks. Okay. In the last few years, the Super Eagles and the Falcons football, national football team, has been our biggest brands. They've been our biggest exports. Love they it have. or leave it. They it's have. not petroleum, it's not tin ore, it's they not have. gold, it's the football. Even, it's like, even in sports fashion, the release of the Super Eagles jersey in 2018 for the World Cup, till this day, is one of the best football jerseys exactly. in the history in the, in the of football. World. Exactly. So, so we yeah. are, this is our biggest brand. And Cheers. we hear of regular brands, musicians, we hear of the children of ministers, mm. children of senators, who get helicopters, who get <laughs> private jets, <laughs> to actually go Farther than Benin Republic, and then we take our biggest brand by boats Father, to Port Novo next if, door. Even in between the, the, the federation, between the nation, rich or influential individuals use helicopters to travel from exactly. States. Even even between or even in the states, they can go from let's say Ikeja to Lagos Island with a chopper. It happens a lot in Nigeria. Um, you, to add to that statement, you're very very right because as a as a brand, as a, as a matter of fact, for many Nigerians. Nas the national football team is a source of identi identification for us, like a national pride. Yeah. Um, yes, we haven't performed to the best of our levels in the last few or four years, last few years. But even if you go to the peak period of Nigerian football in, in the in the mid nineties, it was a source because then we were flagged as a nation that had you know military dictatorship and all that whole stuff. But the national team at USA ninety four World Cup, colorful, fantastic okay, football. Okay, so Victor, I'll come to you shortly. Okay. I've got Wally Adigo on the phone with us this morning. Wally Adigo is a the sports journalist of repute, of, of, who explains to us extensively. And if, if you know him well, he speaks his mind. Wally Adi, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Wally. How are you doing today, Wally? Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good to be here. Wally, we're talking about um, the Super Eagles, and I was talking to the Vice President NFF, um, Shiakiumi, on Tuesday. When I told him, are the Eagles going to go by air? The answer was, you wish. He was joking. I didn't say any joking, really. Eventually went by boat, and I think our biggest brand on a national mission taking a risk by boat to Port Novo. What's your take on this one? Well, Wally, I said that 
that was a, I thought it was a fantastic way from the NFL, basically. Um, because to be very, very honest, to be very objective, going by aerial expenses, not that we can't afford it. Going by road is the logo. Uh, me and you, we both know that the road network from Lagos to the Republic is, is nothing to write in the band. So I saw that going by sea, the first time in 1949, I thought it was, a, it was just a fantastic experience for everyone. I mean, the players in the units, even Nigerians who were not part of the experience, savored all of the moment on social media. And I thought it was just something that was um, fantastic. I, I just thought that they had to think out of the box. And um, I understand that the journey lasted about two hours, 45 minutes. But it wasn't bad at all. You know, it wasn't bad at all. And I think that the biggest the biggest lesson we can learn from here is the fact that the transportation network in Africa, especially in the region of West Africa, we have to work on it. You know, no doubt. Um, I think that there's a probability that players will be sick. But what I've heard so far from players and people who players was that they loved the experience. So um, I thought it was, it was good. Um, the logistics was very nice. Um, the Lagos State Government also has to get enough credit because um, it was the agency um, of the work police that um, ensured this was a smooth and seamless operation. And the security was top notch. You know, I understand. So, um, Wale, I don't think I've got any quarrels with it. Uh, but most importantly, is going to Benin Republic and get that point and secure the operation. Okay, stay with us, um, Wale. Don't go anywhere. Victor, the good news is, our players said, despite all, they enjoyed the experience. So well, why are we complaining for them now? Well, the thing, we're <laughs> not complaining for them. Yeah. Like, it's, 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 these are individual experiences. Uh, it is, look, it's subjective. You may like it. and you may, like, For instance, like I said, it was like going to a party with your friends or going to the like picnic. Like a picnic, party. yeah. Exactly. We've done all this before. You have a boat ride and you have a good time. But what like you mentioned is the official, you know, um, uh, like the so official uh, journey for these guys to go towards getting something done. For me personally, there's not, nothing wrong with that to an extent, but if it's a national team, and I personally feel that when you say it's too expensive, the taxpayers, what are we doing? Like this, this is an issue, at least it's, it's not every time. We've not had international football for a while due to the pandemic. pandemic yeah. So where has, we, I mean, apart from maybe helping the economy get back to its feet, where have we been spending our money? So I think we, we still have, in, for me personally, I think they shouldn't have gone by book. And then the risks are really high. I mean, like, I mean, if something bad had happened, and most of these players, obviously, I know they are premier athletes, but you don't want to be inside the water or something. You, don't, you can't really just say. So that's just a personal opinion. If the individual players loved it, obviously they should. They're all young individuals. They all, most of them play in the same country, and they all have a very wonderful team spirit. So I can understand that, oh, I'm going with Alex, or I'm going with Madhu Okoye, and everybody's just having a good time. But the reality of the matter is... I believe that the NFF could have done better in terms of providing better means of transportation for the national Okay, team. let's move forward on the show now. Okay. Now, Super Eagles will be aiming to seal qualification to the 2021 African Cup of Nations when the team confronted squirrels of the Republic at the State Charles de Gaulle in Porto Novo today. Super Eagles are one point clear of Benin Republic at the top of Group L, but neither side are secure in qualification, with Sierra Leone and Lesotho not too far behind. Now, Gennett Ross side remains unbeaten in the opening four games, beating Benin Republic and Lesotho with two draws against Sierra Leone, including a 4-4 thriller at home in November, which did see them lose a four-goal lead. Shameful. Overall, Sunday visitors have a historical advantage over their hosts, who they have beaten in 12 of the 15 previous clashes, losing just once in their time. Okay, now, before I go to the next one, Wally, I'll come to you on this one. If I go to Gennett Raw, talking today, when will we stop having this um, shameful show of um, unhealthy competition? Our boys got to Charles de Gaulle to train. The floodlights were off. The claim wasn't working. They had to train under the moon. They used the moonlights to train. Um, the, first of all, the light was that they don't have their players in, from abroad. They had, they had to use home-based players. Overnight, the abroad players came, came, came through from Le Championnat, like five of them. This is just a necessary decoy. First, they lie about their players, and now the stadium. They refuse to put on lights, so we have to train under the moonlight. It's shameful. This is unhealthy rivalry. Yeah, um, Wale, I, I, I do it to you. Let's be very, very honest with myself. We're expecting a country that I've known for only eight years 
to welcome us singing Kumbaya? No. They were never going to welcome us with open arms. And um, despite the proximity between both countries, I mean, we share a whole lot. Um, while I saw videos of, of the Benin Latin singing Yoruba song, we know that we know the relationship between Benin Republic and Nigeria. But they also have a lot to protect. They, I mean, they have to qualify. So I thought the NFL, the players, everyone, would have gone there prepared for the worst. We are not new to this. You know, we are not new to this. And I mean, it happens a lot of times because when those countries come, we walk on with them with open arms and we travel and they treat us bad. But it also, it's all part of the anti. So I don't see anything, I ain't seen bad in there. It's a, it's, it's a characteristic of African football. We just have to be, be focused, do the job, get the points, and qualify, come back to Lesotho, and, and, and come celebrate our qualification. That's just what I'm about. Okay, well, let me come to Victor here. Before I do that, um, Gennon Raw did not particularly complain. He made it sound like it was normal, but I think it's unhealthy rivalry. Gennon Raw speaks about their training and their experience during the training. It was a very special journey. You were with us, you saw it. Uh -huh. It was nice, but it was not easy. We had some little problems, but we arrived well, and uh, even if it was very late, we could do a, a training session. Then we missed the light, so the light was broken, but we handled with it. We have the full moon, so there is also a little light. Tomorrow, I feel harmony in my team. Even if there are some problems, we are all the time positive mind. And we want to do as a big challenge to win here tomorrow because they didn't lose a match since eight years. So we want to do that, but you know that this draw already, we have the ticket for the AFCON. This is our first target, and then later we will speak about the second match. Everybody is fit, no injury, and I hope that uh, we can do what we want to do. Thank you very much, Coach. Thank you. I yes. like um, Gennot Ross, Victor, I like mm -hmm. Gennot Ross' attitude towards the situation. Okay. He said, yes, they didn't put the lights on for us. They claimed the lights were bad. Mm. But luckily, we have the compliment of the full moon. So I like the attitude towards that. But well, well, it I doesn't make it right. Exactly, because I have an issue. What if we were playing this football match in the period where we don't have the full moon? What happens? You know, so the reality of the matter is this. As a matter of fact, I, I know this is a staple of African football, actually. Poor infrastructure and then using very nefarious and mischievous ways to try and get... Well, would you agree with Victor here when he says poor infrastructure? I think that was on purpose. The lights were not put on on purpose. I don't think it was poor infrastructure. What do you think? No, of course. Of course, of course. I, don't, I don't think it's an infrastructure problem. Um, um, I, I think that it's part of the anti in African football. You see that a lot in the Cup Champions League, Cup exactly. Confederation Cup. We see that in international football on the continent. So, I don't think the NFL will have been at this, at this treatment, you know, from the Benenoa um, Football Federation or whoever I mean, is in charge of their football. We just have to be focused. And I think that's the most important thing for the Super Eagles. Raw has to keep them focused. I mean, the only training session they had for this game today was last night. And I don't think that training session would, would have bared much on whatever they were going to churn out today. You know, so I think that Raw has to keep the players focused. And um, the players are not, they're not novices. I mean, they know what goes on in African football. This is not the first time we have traveled and been subjected to treatment like this. Uh, it, can, it can be worse. I mean, it can be worse than this while it, you are going through. So I, I think that the most important thing is keeping the focus, keeping the strength, and going there to pick what is necessary. Yeah, Victor, um, Wally agrees here and says that he doesn't think it's the case of poor infrastructure. Well, he thinks it was the antique. We have heard of, of going to North Africa. Mm. In the Champions oh, yeah, League yeah, level, yeah, yeah, yes, and yes. then they put us in the hotel where they, yeah. they had a party downstairs, <laughs> and they couldn't sleep all night. Yeah. It's all of the antique, really. Yeah. But like I said earlier, mm -hmm. I think all of Raw's package is that don't get the boys discouraged. Keep them encouraged by saying, "Well, we had the, the full moon, the conference of the full moon, so it was nice. The moon was we, all that one. Just try to sack the boys up. Don't don't think about it. Don't let it dampen your spirits and all mm. that." But like what they said, most of the boys are Nigerians. Even if they don't live here, they know the antiques of Niger African cities. But I just feel like. In 2021, I think all this unhealthy rivalry should have stopped. Well, just to add to my earlier statement, I said point for structure, but I also added that 
mischievous you know means of like for instance switching off the light on purpose just to clarify that statement uh to add how to can the floodlights not be working 24 hours to a major match like this <laughs> well so here's the thing you, you know it is i think is the mindset and mentality of of african sports especially football which is the biggest one of the biggest sports in africa and of course when you come to club competitions intercontinental club competitions where you have the teams from the north teams from the south east west and you know, trying to all play and get they are, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are teams up. Everyone wants to take advantage. For instance, with the national team right now, we know that we have, when it comes to professionals, the national team have the best. Like, you can't compare, with all due respect to the squirrels of Benin, you can't compare their level of players to ours. It's just a simple fact. However, those external factors can play a part. But these are also professional players. And being a professional player means you brave the weather, you brave the storm, whatever the issues are, you focus on what you have. I like, win. Like, yeah, That's I, what Ross said. But, but like he said, like our other analyst said, you know, the psychological effects and how just one training session in the dark really help this guy become cohesive. Because here's the thing, you can have the great skills, but if you don't play as a team, you've seen it before, many, many national teams have fantastic individual players, but it's playing as a team that really, really matters. Yeah. And I really hope that these boys will just click today. Like, for some reason, they will just click and they will play. Bond. Yeah, exactly. And play fantastic Let's look at possible lineups for Benin Republic and, of course, Nigeria. Yeah. Um, Benin Republic, we have Alagbe, Roche, Adenon, Ontuji, Asogba, De Almeida, Anvil, Imoru, Bosu, Jigla, Muni. And Nigeria, Maduka Okoye, Sanusi, Balogun, Trust Ekung, Aino, Aribo, Ndidi, Etebo, Iwobi, Yenacho, and Victor Osime. Um, why let me start with the strike force, the last third. This is massive. You put Iwobi, Iyenacho, and Osime against the Republic. That is massive attack. They are assassins, three of them. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, we still let Iyenacho in Britain for Leicester City. And I think we have to tap into it. Very, very crucial. But we also remember that Iwobi is coming back in the international government. Um, he hasn't played, he was dropped you know, for the nation's cup in Egypt. So he has, he wants to come in and, and, and prove a point to get up more. But Victor Sima also remember, I mean, it's been the main thing of, of the Super Eagles, you know, attack. So he's also coping. Um, I think that he's had a stop that season in Napoli. But with the Super Eagles, it gives one of the things. You know, so left to, to me, I would like to see the little start, but where exactly does it start? Now, I don't think that it's going to start as a number nine because it does make get that slow. Now, on the general road, we have a system that encourages a player behind the striker. If he's going to encourage that today, then Kelechi Yana to start. If he doesn't, I don't see a way Kelechi Yana to get into the team or get into the starting lineup of today's game. Uh, but from the flanks, you know that Ahmed Musa will not start, you know, because he's there as a... Um, as a figurehead, I mean, he's the captain of the side, but hasn't played football in about five, six months. He doesn't play football, he's not going to play. So, probably have players like Alex Wobby. I mean, maybe maybe a, 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 a devil's advocate, I'm, I'm going to play a very long shot here. And I Iwala for Eiba has been really good this season. Hmm. I don't know if he's made enough of an impression on Gerard Raw to be able to start in a big game like this, but. Odds are very, very, very high that he won't start. But players like uh, like uh, like Iwobi are going to start. Maybe Enrio Yekuru also, you know, because Samuel Carlo has, has has left, you know, didn't come because you know he was injured uh, while playing for Bordeaux. So, but it'll be very, very interesting to see how we set up. I think the setup will be is going to be a much more cautious setting because Raw knows that we don't have to go for the field. He knows that we don't have to necessarily, you know, go for all three points. But like you said, it will be very interesting how we pair up in attack. But I think that Victor Simeon will start. Hopefully, there is a system that accommodates us playing Kilich near that show because the great form is in right now, we have to tap into it. Okay, now Victor, let me come to you now. Um, considering knowing what these boys can do normally, yeah. and considering the, their form in the past few weeks in their clubs, yeah. Is there any defense line in Africa can, can stop a strike force of Iwobi, Osime, and, um, and uh, Kelechi as we speak? No, I it's have, massive. I actually have to say no to that uh, because the reality of the matter is that Ian Acho, obviously, fantastic form, nominated for goal of the month and also player of the month for the Premier League, which is massive. Um, he's the highest goal scorer from Nigeria in the FA Cup. So that, that even, as in FA Cup history, by the way, that even shows how fantastic this young man is right now. 
Osimhen, like uh, Wale said, that he has had a bit of a stop and start season, but it doesn't take away the quality from Osimhen. Osimhen's positioning is almost like Rashid Yakini back in the day. He just is fantastic and he's also very fast. Same with Alex Iwobi, he has that amazing vision. So with the Nash, with, 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 I mean, we saw that ability against Sierra Leone in the first half. Yeah, in our last match, you know, or not the last match, but the last second to the last match, and they were fantastic. Four nil in almost the first twenty-five minutes before we, you know, got one back and it ended up end up four one at halftime. But I don't think any African defense can cope with their ability, especially if they are playing to their full, you know, full strength. Like he mentioned, what position or what formation would the coach take to give these three guys the the freedom and room to really perform? And don't forget. But the Republic are coming to win this match. They are not taking it lightly. I mean, yes, they are prepared on their own. They've tried to be mischievous with switching off the lights and you know, maybe not giving us one or two things we need to prepare pr properly. But they are coming to win this game. So, like he mentioned, uh, he, you have to be cautious, but at the same time, you have to give these three guys freedom to do their what thing. What they can do. Now, Wale, stuff. whether you like it or not, most Nigerians, whether you're a presenter, whether you're a football fan, have their fingers crossed. We don't want deja vu this evening. We had very fantastic players against Sierra Leone. We had a 4 0 lead and it ended 4 4. Nigerians are still scared. We might see deja vu today. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that sense of cautiousness that you've um, brought up. And it's, it's important that we approach this game with a lot of professionalism. But my problem has been the fact that. While building up to the game against the Republic, which is a much more important game than the Lesotho game, you know, next week Tuesday, I feel that we might just be repeating the mistakes we did against Sierra Leone. So what were those mistakes that we did here? Building up to Sierra I mean, we're talking about tomorrow, we're going to have a fanfare, the sports base was training with the team, the deputy governor, was training with the team. And I mean, that sent some messages to Syria. I mean, they felt that we we're taking them for a ride. And guess what? They gave us the shock of our lives. And as we go into the Benin Republic game, you could notice that there's been a lot of hype about the fact that the people who are coming back to Libya for the first time in 20 years. I have no problems with that. But I think that we have. Um, Put that on the top of the hill, and we are neglecting the fact that we have to play better Republic and we have to get a point. It is very, very important. And I I, I wish all the Labour State governments and the, you know, by extension the Stock Commission for drumming up our privatization. But I think it's crucial that we face this Benin Republic game. I continue to tell you guys that they have not lost the whole game in eight years. Michel de Soyal is the coach of the side. As a still a new brand of football, they're a much more physical side, you know, and that will help us today. You know, if you're going to watch the game, you're going to see how the players are going to go very physical on us. And the good thing for them is that they have a full complement of their players now. I mean, a lot of their players are based in France. Initially, they couldn't come, you know, because of um, COVID 19 travel restrictions. But now that France have restricted or they've relaxed those you know, restrictions. They have a full complement of their players. There's Steve Lune, a lot of them, you know, to be playing this game. And I think that we have to put our focus on this game and forget about the Let's Go to Go until 90 minutes is done, you know, in, 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 in boxing over. And that's why I'm, I'm really worried that those of you, I see a lot of those of you, I think that we are getting overconfident, but I hope that our players can be professional enough. And go in there and do the gym and get us the point. Okay, Wally, yeah. right, before we move forward and before I come to you again, before we go on the show, or before we um, move on on the show, Wally said something. Let's quickly talk about this quickly and then okay. we'll, go to, we'll move forward. Wally spoke about us getting overconfidence before the okay. match against Sierra Leone. Yeah. The deputy governor of Edo State claims he was a footballer, was training with the team. We're feeling it was a jamboree <laughs> at a point. And then we ended it like that way. And then yeah. we went to Sierra Leone again and it was still a goalless draw. Yeah. But he says things are more serious minded. This time around, we don't want to make the same mistake again. Well, as it should be. It's not a jamboree now. Because it, the government don't play. Yeah. Just, you know? As it should be. Like, as a matter of fact, like the coach said, Gennard Ross said, the most important match for us is actually what we're going to face today. Now, the reality of the match, you mentioned Osime, Alex Wobi, our attacking power is fantastic. We have great attacking talent. But the, in, in the way matches in African football, like you have experienced, the defensive departments have to be on point, especially if you are playing an away match to get the victory. 
For me personally, I think our goalkeeper in the pack pan is still shaky. Madro Kui has done well for his club in Sparta, Rotterdam, in Holland. Uh, but I hope that Leon Balogu, after winning the Scottish Premier League with Rangers and, you know, Ekong would really step up their game today. And thankfully, Wilfred Ndidi is back. So we have that much needed cover because if you watch that game, I mean, we were all shocked as we were watching Sierra Leone just run through our midfield. Like, what is going on here? So the defensive department, as much as we have great talents going forward, especially in this match against Benin today, we need a goalkeeper, whoever it will be, either Madu or you know Uzoho, to be at their best form. Same with our centre back pairing, and of course, referring did he play as he has been playing for Leicester City, showing how good he is in the midfield. Why moving forward quickly? Prediction. Tonight, this evening. Um, I, I think that we're going to struggle a bit. You know, we. I think that we'll get we'll get a necessary point. I think the game went in the draw. But I don't I don't see us winning. We have a very dodgy record away from home. Uh, maybe if they fall into super goals in qualifiers, we haven't really been a force away from home. So but I think that we'll win six. We'll probably get a point and and qualify. Why he doesn't see us winning? What do you think? Well, well, I would, if this will get a draw, I qualify. would disagree with that. Do a draw is a more realistic take, but I'll still go with a 2-1 victory for the national team today because okay. of the power. Let's move forward. Back. Some sad news <clears throat> again this morning about the World Cup. Now, the players of the Dutch national soccer team will make a statement before the World Cup qualifier against Latvia to draw attention to workers' rights in Qatar. Defender Matthijs De Ligt announced on Friday yesterday. Now, earlier this week, the German and Norwegian teams protested against the Gulf states' alleged treatment of workers ahead of their World Cup qualifiers. Nou, ik kan je wel een primeurtje geven dat we morgen iets zullen doen. Wat kan ik niet zeggen. Ik denk dat jullie dat morgen zullen zien. Dus uh, nee, dat is, uh, dat is zeker aan de orde. Jullie hebben daar de afgelopen dagen met de spelersgroep over gesproken? Ja, we hebben, we hebben het al heel lang besproken. Het is natuurlijk een uh, best wel gevoelig onderwerp. En, uh, Ja, ik denk dat het wel duidelijk is dat wij, uh, wat onze mening is. Wij vinden natuurlijk ook dat het, uh, ja, dat het een hele, hele lastige situatie is met, uh, met de, uh, de arbeidersrechten daar. Now in their match against Gibraltar, the Norway team, including Arsenal's unknown midfielder Martin Odegaard and Borussia Dortmund striker Erling Haaland, wore t-shirts saying human rights on and off the pitch. All the players have been punished by FIFA and other football governing bodies in the past for making political statements. No action will follow from the protest, soccer's world governing body FIFA later announced. Now, on Thursday, spokesperson for the Quattari World Cup organizers, the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, said we have always been transparent about the health and safety of workers on projects directly related to the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Now, the world says that's a lie. That those guys are dying, some from Indonesia, some from Bangladesh, some different countries. Some have died, they will send their bodies home and say they died of natural causes. They say they don't sleep well, say they don't take care of them. Wally, let's start with you. The condition of the workers at the stadiums in Qatar is terrible. Yeah, of course. Um, that, has, that has been making it And it's a really it's been a sad thing. It's been one of the, the blocks I mean, the record of Qatar. You know, aside from 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 the human rights abuse with um, the workers, there's been a, a, a much more human rights issue in Qatar as a country, as a nation, you know, from a global spectrum, the global point of view. And it's been a shame that Qatar hasn't been able to address it. You know, um, what they've tried to do is um, spot wash the image you know, of the country, sports watch the image of the Qatar World Cup in 2022 uh, with, um, you know, players like, or ex like Zambi. Remember that Zambi is in the outside, but also uh, will be an ambassador at a, a certain move, you know, for Qatar 2022. Uh, but I hope that they can address this. But my, my, my big worry is Norway have made a statement, Denmark, EU, now, you know, we're seeing the, the Dutch team are going to make a statement during their second round of World Cup qualified. But to what end, you know, how much of an impact does that have, you know, going forward next year's World Cup? I mean, okay. there is a right that, I mean, the normal World Cup is about eight pounds a day, you know, and subjected to a lot of maltreatment. It's a shame, honestly. 
and it is something that will overshadow the potential to overshadow you know the World Cup itself. No doubt. While the FIFA will get much more you know active, they've been very quiet. Well, they've been very very quiet on the human rights and abuse of in, in Qatar. I hope that they can find their voice. And hopefully everyone congregates for what should be a fantastic world for next year. Okay, moving forward. <clears throat> well, he says it's a shame. Eight pounds, a day, eight, eight dollars a day, and they go through the most terrible of conditions. And FIFA has been quiet about it. I'll, 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 come, I'll come to you now. Mm. Now, Germany players, the Diamond Shaft, mm. wore T-shirts mm. to show support for Qatar migrant workers before their 2022 World Cup qualifying win over Iceland on Thursday. Now, the starting side each wore a black shirt with one letter in white on it that spelled out human rights. It follows Norway players wearing T-shirts bearing the message human rights on and off the pitch before facing Gibraltar on Wednesday. Now, the World Cup is scheduled to get underway in Qatar on 21st November next year. After Wednesday's protest, football's world governing body, FIFA, said Norway will not face disciplinary proceedings, adding that it believes in the freedom of speech and the power of football as a force for good. A report in The Guardian last month said 6,500 migrant workers have died in Qatar since the World Cup was awarded in 2010. Qatar disputes that figure and said in a statement, we deeply regret all of these tragedies and investigated each incident to ensure lessons were learned. We have always maintained transparency around this issue and dispute inaccurate claims around the number of workers who have died on our projects. The Qatari government said the mortality rate among these communities is within the expected range for the size and demographics of the population. Six, Victor, <laughs> even in a case of genocide, is, sometimes we don't have up to 6,500 6, migrant workers have died in Qatar. And they say it was investigated. Most of the causes were natural. Mm. Who are they talking to? Exactly. Us? So, so here's the thing, right? When, when the, when the stories of this death started coming out, it was about maybe 2012, 2011, and it, you know, at first, because you know, it's a massive project. It's the World Cup. They are building new stadiums, which is is understandable. That you have one or two disasters, it happens in construction, right? But like you've mentioned, 6,500, 6,500 workers dying in your watch or on your watch is actually very, very poor because, so what are the safety measures? But let's even forget about the, the pay, which is incredibly low, but let's see the safety measures. What, what are they, how are they even working? Where are the harnesses? Who are the people, you know, from the construction companies? How are you giving them a license to continue building stadiums where people are dying maybe one or two, two times a week? Because that's how you can get that kind of number. 6,500 is a lot of people that have died. And that is, and of course it's been disputed. It could be more, you know, from what we know. So. I think personally, like we've mentioned before, FIFA have to come up, come out and say something about this. Apart from FIFA, let's talk about the local organizing community. What are you guys doing? How how is the working conditions? Because if it is a safe environment, you wouldn't have such a high mortality rate of people dying trying to build stadiums for. And again, football is a very beautiful sport. We shouldn't have this overshadowing. And of course, the World Cup is going to happen in November, the first time in the history of the World Cup. So we have anything to celebrate about this unique World Cup, not the deaths of people working at the World Cup. Now, Wale, I am not trying to promote violence in any form. <laughs> I will never do that. But this is just me. If I play abroad and you don't like me because of my skin and you insult me, I will punch you. Mm. This is just me. I'm not promoting violence. I don't, I don't think it's right. But this is just me. I won't take it. But we see some players who are very mature about it, Danny Alves. They threw him banana, he peeled it and ate it. That's not me. I'm not that diplomatic. What's your take, really? How can you hate me because of the color of my skin? You don't even know me. Yeah, I mean, see, you have to re you have to realize in this part of the world that that racism is um is institutionalized. It's more of an institution thing. Um, it is that deep that you know even kings already know what racism is. That is how that's how institutionalized racism is. But I I don't think the case in Qatar has been about about racism. It's just been about abuse of, of, of labor laws, abuse of human rights. And once again, I mean, I agree with, with Geoffrey over there. Who has to find its voice? It is very, very crucial. Okay, why well, Because well, yeah, come what people has done is, is try to be non committal about what has been happening. Okay, while well, yeah, I come so to you, come to you. Usually, I find the likes of Germany, Norway, yeah. Denmark, you know, for showing, you know, support. 
you know, and, and showing their discontent were happening in Qatar, but they didn't. But also, they could easily also have said, we are going to rip you off your World Cup hosting rights, but they haven't. So what, what FIFA has done is sit on the pen. Okay, Wally, and slow down. Let me come to that. Um, yeah, going back to the human rights abuse, now let me come to the, the, the story I'm moving forward with. Now, former Arsenal and France striker Thierry Henry mm -hmm. says he's removing himself from social media because of racism and bullying across platforms. Now, Henry is 43, posted a message to his 2.3 million followers on Twitter on Friday saying the problem was too toxic to ignore. He said he would not return to social media and companies regulate their platforms with the same vigor and ferocity that they currently do when you infringe on copyrights. Henri called for greater action. Henri won two Premier League titles with Arsenal, where he played between 1999 and 2007. Last September, he detail, detailed instances of racism he experienced during his playing career with Arsenal and France. Now, Wale, I'm sure you, are, you know about this. Whenever you infringe on copyrights on social media, bam, in one hour, they, 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 they give you a strike and you're out. But when, you come, when, they, when they insult people racially, they, they look away most times. The social media, look away. When you infringe on copyrights, you get a strike in 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with you that the social media owners were not the popular ones, Twitter, you know, especially. There's Facebook. They've been there. I mean, there's been a lot of double standard in the way they've operated. And I think that I'm going to really, really applaud on this one. But now the question is, how many, how many Henri's are going to beat social media because of racism? That's the big question. Because, I mean, the upside of social media is that a lot of footballers, a lot of ex-footballers, a lot of sportsmen have become influencers, you know, for different brands, and they can reach out to their fans on social media. So who is ready to make that hard line stand? You know, um, or, 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 you know, banning social media. Already, already, already I checked the social media today. He already is, is off Twitter. He's, I mean, true to his words, he said, first thing today, I was going to go off Twitter. And I checked him this morning. He already deactivated it. And I mean, Ori said that the sheer volume of racism, bullying, is, is resulting to a lot of mental torture, you know, to a lot of individuals. And it's getting too toxic. Yeah, it's getting too, too really toxic. Every weekend in the Premier League, with the Championship, in the lower levels of English football, basically, one football, you get to see cases of faceless fans abuse players, abuse sportsmen, you know, because of bad performances, and they start abusing them racially. And it's a shame. Okay. It's a big, big shame. And once again, what it, what it, well, yeah. we have very little time to go on the show today, but really, before I go to my next um, discussion, um, we know for one that as of this morning, Thierry Henry had deactivated all his social media accounts, all as of this morning. Now, there's this particular footballer in the English Premier League who says, I will not take the knee because I am dark skinned. I am king. I won't take the knee. Who? Zaha. Yeah, Rufus Zaha says, I won't take the knee. I am dark skinned. I am king. I won't take the knee for the light skinned person. And they're saying, why would he take the knee? He doesn't want to take the knee. He thinks he's king. Um, I, I don't think that is why he is so going to take the knee. He's only saying that taking the knee has become a possession. A difference, yes. Taking the knee has become like a norm. Mm. And it is not a two-generation result. True. Because all the while they've been taking the knee, there has still been racism everywhere. They've still had been racially targeted by fans and faceless people all across you know, the, the world. True. And he said that, whilst I take the day, he's not, he's not achieving any result. So it's better I don't take the knee anymore. And that's what I think of the guy's thing. But okay. until social media people take action, where they burn in the pants, burn in the pants, then he will start seeing the taking the knee as, as something that is achieving more yeah. result. But right now, Taking the knee and I agree with you. Okay, thank you very much, Wale. Thank you very much for joining us on the show this morning. Thank you very much, Wale Adigu. That was a very You're extensive. Welcome. And we hope that when we send, we'll call you again next time you'll be here to actually <laughs> help us again as usual. No problems. Thank you very much, bro. Now um, I'll come to you now, Victor, on that one. Um, mm. 
Zaha refuses to take the knee. Yeah. He said, I'm a dark skinned person, I'm black and I'm king. Yes. And taking the knee has not made a difference in the past few years. What's the point of wasting my time? So, like we've established, I mean, one thing we learned from the pandemic was the fact that the world was more aware of systematic racism, not just in North America, also in Europe. And it's a global thing. Uh, because of the color of your skin, the shade of your skin, you are being attacked or wow. being discriminated. As a matter of fact, even, know me. even recently, uh, there's a lot of attack on Asian, the Asian minority in, in USA, yeah. which is remarkable. So um, for Zaha's instance, I agree with him because the thing is this, we've t no, like, he, like he just mentioned, it's now becoming a norm. Almost every football match, you see people go down. But what, what yeah, actions... After the match. Exactly. For instance, like he mentioned in the Premier League, it's so toxic. Social media is actually a very toxic place. And the reason because there's no accountability. I can go online as an anonymous user open an account and I can just have racial slurs on someone and nobody can hold me accountable. You see sometimes in the comment section where people always are very, very toxic and they might say some things that are, that are not needed. But because you can't do anything, you can only see their profile or see their picture. You can't, you can't hit them, like you mentioned. You can't punch them in your own case, not promoting violence, of course. But the reality of the matter is that, like what Henri has said, and what Zaha is doing, we need more massive, and not just superstars or international individuals with a darker skin tone like those who are caucasian those who are who have are going through this exactly, too. who are soon have the privilege let's move forward a little because of our time yeah? well. now some of the biggest names at the miami open went through to the third round yesterday with them commanding victories but there was a surprise as britain's cameron nori knocked out gregor dimitrov now nori achieved a straight sets win on a hot day in florida <clears> in a game featuring long rallies bulgaria's dimitrov looked to have the first set under control, but Nori held his nerve to fight back and claim the set. He went on to win the match 7-5, 7-5. Russia's Daniel Medvedev had a more straightforward day out as he overpowered Taiwan's Lu Yen Soon, 6-2, 6-2. Canada's impressive youngster Felix Anger Aliasime outmatched Frenchman Pierre Hughes Herber, 6-4, 6-4. Elsewhere, the battle between two Americans, Taylor Fritz, proved too much for Marcus Giron, winning their match 6-2. 6-2. Okay, that's all we can take on the show today. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's Victor, massive, you're free, and we massive hope, um, pleasure. I want to see you again. Hope you will oh, find. For sure. Don't worry, I'll find you. <laughs> okay, we'll leave you with um, tennis on the show today, plus sports special on plus sports Africa. My name is Wally Scott. Join us same time next week for another special program, plus sports special. And like I always advise you at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports.